If you're watching this recording, we will start uh, soon as everyone enters in to the room. Hello. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Yes, sir. Excellent. Okay. We're bringing everybody in now. Okay. Hello, everybody. We may have a few more joining us as we go. Yeah, one, one more right there. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. I hope everybody can see me and hear me. We're going to uh, go ahead and get started with a prayer as we uh, bring more people into the room. All right. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Christ has risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And that we have beheld the resurrection of Christ, let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. Thy cross we adore, O Christ, and the holy resurrection we praise and glorify, for thou art our God, and we know none other besides thee. We call upon thy name. O come all ye faithful, let us adore Christ's holy resurrection, for lo, through the cross, his joy come into all the world. Ever blessing the Lord, let us sing his resurrection, for in that he has endured the cross for us, he has destroyed death through death. O Lord our God, we ask that you help us to hear the teaching of your holy scripture, that it may change our hearts and our minds and our action that we may bring salvation to our souls and be beneficial to other people and glorify thy holy name, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Okay, everybody, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, a few things before we begin. Uh, normally, when I teach a course like this, I would, uh, or a series of courses, I should say, I would probably teach the Old Testament uh, narrative, so, sort of like you would find it in a children's book, right? The very basic story. And then the uh, New Testament, and then uh, at least the, the life of Christ, especially, and then the post-Pentecost life of the church, and then go back and look at the Old Testament and really dive in to the depth of, of the scripture. And uh, I'm not doing any of that in this course. I'm really just going into the depth of the scripture. So that's really what we're going to be talking about. Uh, the scripture is, is, to say it's multi-layered is really an understatement. And I mean, the, everything that pertains to God is a mystery. And the, the, the church is a mystery. And the scripture is this holy mystery that we don't get our minds right completely around because it's, it's sort of a, uh, an icon that uh, shows us a, a reality that's beyond our comprehension, something that we, we really have to experience for ourselves beyond our rational minds. Uh, so really going to be diving into the Old Testament, and, and uh, we really don't have a time limit for this class. So uh, if, if we go over something, it might be basic. If we're going through the story, and, the, and 
you really don't know the flow of the Old Testament story uh, and you have some questions, let me know if there's a particular something that we talk about you want to talk about more, let me know. You can always email me uh, and um, we, we can always talk about things a little more in a little more detail. There's, there's always rabbit holes, right? There are always places uh, you can go and, and go deeper into very, very particular uh, topics. And I, I could, I could do, we could just stay in Genesis one through three, right. And stay there for, uh, for a few years, probably at least. So um, I want to mention a couple of things uh, sort of that pertain uh, to this, a couple of projects uh, that I've been working on. One is I, I have a podcast where I think we've released six episodes now. It's really designed for physicians and people in healthcare. Uh, but it's really about the the spiritual uh, life and how the uh, the way that the church understands theology, which is the way of healing, intersects with with medicine and has really since the first century. My next episode is going to talk about three doctors. All three of them are women, and all three of them lived during the time of the apostles and and are related to people. Uh, mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, so we have a, a very long tradition of the practice of medicine in Orthodoxy. And I'm also going to be drawing from a book, uh, at least eventually, on uh, how out of Orthodox culture, the, how the, the hospital as we know it uh, developed. So uh, that's something I've got going on. I've got a new podcast coming out, really, that relates to Eastern culture, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, East Asia, uh, repentance, right, which is sort of this uh, turning to the East uh, symbolically. A lot of those things will be coming out soon. Uh, also, in the beginning of June, it's if you're on our list for uh, St. George events, you may have seen that there are two people coming to Houston the beginning of June, uh, and it is Dr. David Ford and his wife, Dr. Mary Ford. Dr. David is a professor of uh, church history at St. Tikhon's uh, Seminary. Dr. Mary teaches uh, New Testament and, uh, and hermeneutics and uh, biblical interpretation. So if you're interested, uh, please come to this. This is uh, Friday, June 3rd, 7 p.m. Uh, and he's really coming to St. George because he's here for a marriage retreat at another parish in spring, and he's one of my old professors, so uh, he asked if he could come and speak at St. George. Specifically, he's talking about uh, a new book series he's doing on St. John Chrysostom, you know, the golden mouth, one of the greatest preachers in the history of the church, and it's amazing. St. John Chrysostom, even though he lived in the fourth century, some of the things he talks about, they're, they're so relevant to today. I mean, it, it's funny, you know, how we get frustrated that people can go to football games and they go outside and they're hot and they're sweaty and, and they can rain and it doesn't matter, right? As, as if your team is doing well, especially it doesn't matter and you know about the players, right? But then the same people who do that, they can't name, you know, some of the books of the Bible. Well, he talks about that, but he's talking about the chariot races. Like it's the same thing. Uh, so uh, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's uh, his wisdom is uh, is really beautiful and relates to us today. So his his book series is called "Sing to Your Soul." Uh, I'm holding in my hand the volume one, which is the narrative of salvation history. Uh, I mean, still my favorite commentaries. Some of my favorite commentaries when I prepare for preaching and teaching are the commentaries of uh, his sermons from so long ago. We have to preach in a much shorter way today uh, than St. John Chrysostom did because he, he, he was long-winded. Uh, Dr. David and Mary also wrote a book called Marriage as a Path to Holiness, The Lives of Married Saints, which is this big, big, thick book here uh, that came out several years ago. And Dr. Mary, even though she's not really scheduled to speak, she's going to be there, God willing. And uh, she wrote an incredible book called The Soul's Longing, an Orthodox Christian Perspective on Biblical interpretation that I highly recommend if anybody wants to understand how the ancient uh, church in the East uh, interprets the scripture, I, you know, go to that book. It's, uh, it's a, a great place to start. She was my hermeneutics professor. And for those of you that don't know me, I'll tell you a little bit about my 
story, especially as it relates to the Old Testament uh, and kind of my journey to where I am now teaching this course. Uh, I was raised uh, evangelical. Some of my family was uh, religious. Some, some members were not religious. But uh, I would say my background really was, uh, was evangelical, evangelical Protestant. I grew up in Appalachia, so I have influences from, from mountain religion. I have family members that were Pentecostal. Uh, I, I grew up in, in uh, if you know the difference, in uh, a Wesleyan uh, theological kind of background. But one of, one of my uh, mentors who would pray that I would go into the ministry was a five-point Calvinist Baptist. He taught me gospel piano. Uh, and, and that's really my background growing up. I was uh, influenced, actually, by Christian fundamentalism uh, as well at certain times. And uh, I uh, didn't expect myself to be where I am now. You know, I ended up, uh, I guess those prayers worked from my, my mentor. And uh, when I went to college, I, I intended to study international affairs and work for the, for the government the rest of my life. I had uh, already began my military service. And I changed to studying religious studies, which is not necessarily a financially sound decision that I would recommend for most people. But that's, that's what I did. I was, actually, it was humanities. Uh, there are always the, every once in a while, everybody who, who studies humanities and teaches humanities, there's always these articles on why humanities are important. And uh, you won't see me writing one of those, those articles. But uh, I, I, my major was religious studies, uh, classical studies and philosophy. That, it was also part of my degree program. And it was secularized religious studies. I, I could talk a lot about that. It really influenced by uh, liberal 19th century German scholarship and, and, and secular scholarship. Uh, and and that, so, so I studied that. And before that, actually, I'd studied um, Genesis and, and some of the Old Testament in, a, in an Orthodox uh, synagogue, an Orthodox, a Jewish synagogue, um, and had some interesting interesting experiences. Um, but I have that background studying secular religious studies. And one of my takeaways from studying religious studies in a secular school is, do these scholars ever read the scripture? Right? Are they reading what they're theorizing about? Because there seems to be such a disconnection. Uh, and uh, I went from there to Asbury Theological Seminary to get my Master of Divinity from a evangelical school. And I was not a fan of the Old Testament. I have to be honest. In fact, I would say a lot of evangelicals were like, that's the Old Testament, right? All that law, and we want grace. So we don't really use the Old Testament very much. Uh, and in fact, we don't, I would say a lot do not find the Old Testament necessarily uh, relevant. There are certain streams uh, within Protestantism that do you know, to find the narratives of like the Exodus and that sort of thing, um, very powerful. But uh, I, I have to admit that I think the competency exam I had to take uh, so that I didn't have to take any remedial courses in, in biblical content, I skin of my teeth with the Old Testament. I think mostly, really the minor prophets almost got me, but I, I passed it the first time, but it was very, very close because of the minor prophets. Uh, so I, I, I went to seminary and really was not an Old Testament fan. I didn't really focus on the Old Testament. I studied uh, really missiology, church growth evangelism, um, how to build churches, you know, big mega churches. That was an interest of mine back then. Uh, and um, something happened to me. I, I was almost out of seminary. And I, I like to, I, at that point, I like to graduate early if I was in a degree program. So I uh, wanted to get out early. I needed New Testament theology. It was not being offered. And it was only Old Testament theology, which did not excite me. But I sort of had to take it. And I had a professor, uh, the late Mary Fisher, who uh, transformed my view of Scripture. And, and it's because we began studying the Old Testament. And, and she taught us how the Old Testament really um, can only be understood in the light of the New Testament. And really how the Old Testament and New Testament, it's one continuous story, right? There's really no, no break. And uh, it, it transformed everything because the Old Testament became 
uh, are really part of the New Testament, right? It's like if you if you're a fan of a movie and you you only you know you, you really watch the 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 last two movies, but you haven't seen the first movie. I mean, you learn how to understand the first movie. It makes everything starts to make sense, right? There are some characters also, um, you know, in the, th in the last movie, you'll find out something about a character and that character is completely different than, than you thought that, that, you know, that person was like in the first two movies and it changes everything, right? So we need like the whole story. And that's really um, something that happened relatively toward the end of seminary. Uh, I also was influenced by a scholar named N.T. Wright, who happened to be friends with one of my professors, and I got to hear him uh, lecture a few times. And I, I remember one lecture. I was very close to him. I was in the first row, uh, right, right in front of the podium. And uh, he was talking about the road to Emmaus and how Christ took bread and broke it and gave it to his two disciples and they, they took it and their eyes were open and they recognized him. And he said, you know, where else in scripture do we see people taking something to eat and their eyes are open, right? Of course, we, we see that in Genesis. And I think my mouth just dropped and my friend next to me, like his mouth dropped and we just looked at each other. Like we made this connection for the first time. Uh, and later on, when I began learning about the Orthodox Church, really from participating in the services and, and reading, I realized that this is the ancient way of doing interpretation. <laughs> so in the Western world, we've forgotten so much. And we, we, we come up with these connections that we think are absolutely brilliant when uh, the church has known that, you know, 1600 years ago or, or almost nearly 2000 years ago, if not in the apostolic period, sometimes within a few hundred years of the apostolic period, they're talking about things that that uh, in the West we really have, have forgotten. So uh, the thing about orthodoxy is that it, it shows that the story of salvation begins in Genesis and goes through uh, seamlessly into the New Testament and flows into the life of church all the way through church history, right? And those of us who go uh, to St. George, we're under the church of Antioch of Syria. Like we're under the church that sent out Paul and Barnabas, where Christians are first called Christians, you know, our, our headquarters right there in Damascus where St. Paul was converted. Um, so, you know, when I, we, we just read from the scripture about the church of Antioch from the Acts of the Apostles recently in church. And it's like, that's like, that's us. Like, that's not, we're not called like Antioch Baptist Church, like we are the Church of Antioch of Syria with a continuous 2,000 year history, right? Uh, and it, it's an amazing thing. And we go to church with, you know, people from the Holy Land, from, from Bethlehem and Jerusalem and that sort of thing. So we're all part of this, this narrative. Um, so that's where I am now. I came from a lot of different uh, theological uh, viewpoints uh, of seeing the scripture in a lot of different ways before. I came where we are. So what we're going to be talking about is really the Old Testament in the light of Christ, but also uh, the light of, of uh, Christ, the church, right? Because the church is the body of Christ and the temple of the enlightening Holy Spirit. So uh, where really should we begin? First of all, before we start, one more thing. Uh, I'm going to be using the Orthodox Study Bible. Um, and Really, the Orthodox Study Bible, what makes it a little distinctive is the Old Testament draws from the Greek text, the Septuagint, right? Most Bibles that you buy are translated directly from Hebrew, but those are Hebrew texts that went through this editing process, uh, a later editing process. Uh, the Septuagint was translated into Greek in the third century BC. In the third century BC, they, they looked at the best Hebrew manuscripts they could find. And they translated it into Greek because, I mean, most of the Jews were actually uh, Greek speaking, right? And this, and the New Testament was written in Greek. So this is uh, often, in fact, the New Testament, when it quotes from the Bible, uh, from the Old Testament, generally quotes from the Greek text. And, uh, and that's what we use in the church. 
is the Greek text typically. It, it's not that we never quote from from uh, from the Hebrew text, or we don't see that in church history, but we typically use the Greek text of the Old Testament, uh, and that has a, a really nice translation in here. And um, we might talk about some places where it differs from the Hebrew. Um, and the New Testament that I'm using in the Orthodox Study Bible is just really the New King James Version, and that's because this is uh, uh, published by a publisher, I think, that owns the copyright for the New King James. So you can you don't have to use New King James, but that is probably what I might be uh, reading from here. And uh, okay, I think that's a few things about uh, preliminaries. So now maybe we can get get started. So I'm going to share my screen here with you. Okay, let's see. Let's see if this works. Okay. There we go. Could you do you see an icon of Adam and Eve there? Is that share with you? Okay. So, you know, the place we have to really begin when looking at the Old Testament, the best place to start, right, is Genesis 1-1, the very, very beginning. And like I said, we could, we could, we could stay in the, in the very beginning of Genesis for a long time. I'm going to read here. This is from the Orthodox uh, Study Bible. And like I said, if you're using a Bible that, you know, a, a typical Bible that you would buy that translates from the Hebrew. There, there are a few differences we might notice today, but not, not many. I might, like I said, I might point some things out. In the beginning, God made heaven and earth. And the earth was invisible and unfinished, and darkness was over the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light. It was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water, and let it divide the water from the water, and it was so. Thus God made the firmament, and God divided the water under the firmament from the water above the firmament. So God called the firmament heaven, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and morning the second day. Then God said, let the water under heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. The water under heaven was gathered into its places and the dry land appeared. So God called the dry land earth, the gathering together of the waters. He called seas and God saw that it was good. Okay, so this is the beginning of Genesis. You probably know uh, this already, the, uh, the unfolding of the creation here. Now, when we read this in the beginning, this takes us really to the New Testament. There's a connection between this and a New Testament text. And can anybody tell me where that is? In the beginning. Where do we hear John, this? One, one. Yes, John one one. John one one exactly. It's the same word in Greek, right? In our heat, in the beginning, the same uh, same Greek word. And John's gospel really illumines it. I mean, on purpose, it takes us back to Genesis, right? And I'm going to read from uh, John one one, or John, and and following. In the beginning was the word. And remember, word is, in Greek, it's logos. And uh, we actually translate this as dao into, uh, into Chinese. All right. And, and logos, the Greeks had an understanding of logos and, and the Chinese with dao as this, that which gives order and pattern to the universe. Uh, but uh, really, this takes, uh, this isn't like immediately taking us to Greek philosophy or Chinese philosophy, right? This is taking us to the Old Testament, right? If you read Genesis, how does God create? By his word, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? The father creates through his son, right? His word. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So, you know, we, and actually we go a little bit farther, it talks about John the Baptist here, but um, so we have the God creating through his word. In the beginning of Genesis, if you remember, you have uh, God creating, in other words, the Father creating through the Son and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we see the Trinity, the very beginning of creation. And this is something to remember about the Old Testament, is that the Holy Trinity is always present. Wherever you find the Father, you find the Son and the Holy Spirit. Always in cooperation. And wherever uh, you uh, find, uh, well, wherever you find one, you find all of them. I just, just say that, that very simply. So the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are present everywhere in the Old Testament. And that, that's important, and, and we'll talk about that a little later, right? Christ is the Word of God, and uh, this becomes important later. As we go through the narrative, we'll talk about Abraham, for example, when the Word of the Lord comes to Abraham. The Word of the Lord comes to the prophets, right? Who is this? This is, this is Christ. We have uh, God walking with, uh, you know, Adam in, in the garden. The pre-incarnate Christ, right? He hasn't become a human being, but he's present with creation. And it's through the word, it's through the son that we know the father. In the Holy Spirit. Always, always, always present. If we go back, uh, notice in, in Genesis, uh, this unfolding of scripture in Genesis 1, and there was evening and there was morning the first day, right? And, and for us in the church, what is the first service of prayer for uh, a, a particular day? If we did all the services of prayer every day, what would be the very first service of prayer for a particular day? Let's say for tomorrow, what is the first service of prayer? Vespers. Vespers, right? Which is what? Evening prayer. It's the prayer. And we think of it as the end of the day, right? When the sun goes down. But that's actually for us the first service of the day, right? So uh, whatever uh, person that's important to us, whatever saint is important to us in salvation history or what whatever uh, event in salvation history that we're remembering, right? If there's something important tomorrow, uh, we will begin remembering that and recalling it tonight at Vespers, right? That evening and the morning, the first day. So we still uh, really consider liturgically uh, the evening as being the next day. This, this, it gets a little confusing for some of us still, right? During Holy Week, when we're remembering Christ's crucifixion, his burial, resurrection, because when is... Holy Friday for us. When do we remember the crucifixion, right? Thursday, no, it's, it's on Thursday night, right? Thursday night in anticipation. Night. Yeah, so um, if you come Friday night, right, Christ has already been crucified. We've already done uh, a couple services, about well, three services by that time, right? Remembering Christ's crucifixion and, and we're burying him, right? So, um, this this is relevant really to our uh the, to the life in the church and we'll talk about this a little bit later um as we go along we'll be talking a lot about worship how does this relate practically to the to ancient worship that we even do in the 21st century right so we have this unfolding of creation uh and we come down to of course the very end it, which begins chapter two, you know, chapter one is sort of a wide angle lens of creation. And then chapter two 
really is focusing in on uh, our creation as human beings. But the end of this, this first account, uh, beginning of chapter two, thus heaven and earth and all their adornment were finished. And on the seventh day, God finished the works he made and he rested on the seventh day from all the works he made. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his works God began to make. So God, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Of course, when God calls his people Israel, the, the seventh day after, after this pattern is consecrated as a day of rest, a day of prayer. And what, what day is that? What day of the week is the Sabbath? Saturday. Saturday, right. Saturday is the Sabbath. Right now, does anybody know when is the Sabbath fulfilled? When the Sabbath is kept absolutely perfectly. Crucifixion? What is that? Um, during the crucifixion? Well, it's a little bit after. After the crucifixion. That's close. The a little bit after. What's that? The burial of Christ. The burial of Christ. Right when Christ's body is laying in the tomb. Right? The Messiah, the Christ, lays in the tomb, fulfilling the Sabbath perfectly. Now, what's he doing on that day? Right? The priest says this actually every Sunday. The priest brings the gifts. We'll talk about this when we talk about worship. The gifts of bread and wine around the congregation. And we pray for people. And then the priest ascends with the bread and the wine to the holy table and sets them on the holy table, the altar. And the priest says, in the grave with the body, and in Hades with the soul was God, and paradise with the thief, and on the throne with the Father and the Spirit was thou, O Christ, filling all things thyself uncircumscribed. So Christ's body is fulfilling the Sabbath in the tomb. He has descended into a place of the dead where the people of the Old Testament were to, dis to break down the doors of, of, of death of Hades, right? proclaim that death no longer has power over human beings. This is before his physical resurrection. At the same time, he's in paradise with the thief. As he said today, you'll be in paradise. And at the same time, he's where he has been throughout salvation history, for, for always, outside of time and, and in time. And that is on the throne with the Father and the Spirit. When we say that every Sunday, it's beautiful. We may talk about this a little bit later. Um, we can talk about everything a little bit later. There's always, there's, a, there's, a, there's always more. So we have here, uh, this um, fulfilling of the Sabbath uh, when Christ is in the tomb, and that's that's really the fulfilling of the law that we haven't talked about yet. But uh, you know, really, God resting and is also you can think of it about God resting as as a the king of all, right? Sitting down after doing his uh, after doing his work. Uh, so then we have uh, in chapter two this story of the creation of man that again focuses in on 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 human beings. Thus, heaven and earth and all their adornment were finished. I, I did that already. Sorry. We'll start with four. Uh, two, four, Genesis two, four. This is the book of the Genesis of heaven and earth. When they were made in the day, the Lord God made heaven and earth before any plant of the field was on earth. And before any herb of the field sprang up for God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground, but a fountain came up from the ground and watered the whole face of the earth. Then God formed man out of dust from the ground and breathed in his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 
So this is this, this breathing uh, of life uh, into man, man being, being dust. I think I've told this story before uh, for some of, I mean, if you're in enough of my classes, you'll hear stories at least once or twice. But it said that Lazarus, after Christ raised him from the dead, he became a bishop, right? And because um, he was raised to, not to immortality, he was raised to mortality, right? So he eventually died of something else. But he, but he, he was raised to the dead. And, and remember, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, right? And, that, and by that time, decomposing. So this was a healing right? Uh, Christ healing his body and giving him his life back. And it said that, that Lazarus only laughed once, that he had this very, having, having experienced death and, and come back um, at, a, at a very somber mood, uh, and, you know, a, a undoubtedly prayerful disposition after his experience, and that he laughed once because he saw a man stealing a pot and he laughed and said, you know, the clay steals the clay. Because uh, without, without the life of God, right, we're just dust, just like a, a, like a pot, right? And we're, we're brought uh, in, into, into being, right? And this, think about this too, uh, Christ's healing of the blind man, right? You take some, take some dust and spit in it. And 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 anoint the eye. He's creating eyes for the man. Right. This is the one. Who, remember, this is the word who created Adam. It is nothing for him to create eyes from a man being born blind. Right. This is two eight. Then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man he formed. Besides this, God caused every tree beautiful to the sight and good for food to grow from the ground. Also in the middle of the garden, with the tree of life and the tree of learning the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it separated into four heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It circles all the land of Havilah, and there is gold, and the gold of the land is good. And Carbuncle and the Emerald are there as well. The name of the second river is Gihon. It circles all the land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows over against the Assyrians. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man he formed and put him in the garden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded Adam saying, you may eat food from every tree in the garden. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you may not eat. For in whatever day you eat from it, you shall die by death. Now, this is very interesting about the Greek text, right? It, just do it doesn't say you will surely die only. It says you will die by death. Right? What, what is the... Troparian that we sing for Pascha, right? Celebrating the resurrection. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. And trampling down death by death. Life, right? Trampling down death by death. <clears throat> we'll get to this later, right? But you will die by death, but God will save him, uh, destroying death by, by death. We'll talk about that in a minute, like how all of, how all of this is 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 uh, how all of this is healed, right? Because we haven't seen the problem yet. Right now, God has really instituted a very basic fast, a very basic fast, like one commandment, right? Eat from you can eat from any tree. And this is important to remember, right? You can eat from any tree in the garden, like they're all yours. There's just this one tree, like don't. Don't eat from that tree. And, you know, when we look at the interpretation of Genesis uh, in, in the early church, we see that Adam and Eve are in the presence of God. They've been created. Um, we always say in the image and likeness 
but really, if you get very detailed, uh, the scripture actually says according to the image, according to the likeness. And that's really because if you really, if you really get down into it, the, the son is in the image of the father, right? Because the son is God and the father is God. They share one essence. And we're made according to that image. And actually, really, to, according to the image of the son, if we really get detailed. And Adam and Eve held the potentiality, really, to attain this great perfection. They were innocent, and they're described as being, uh, being childlike in innocence. Uh, they, al they also, uh, it was, the, it was, every inclination was to do the will of God, right? Obedience was the natural thing for Adam and Eve. We have broken wills, what we call the gnomic will. But to be clothed in God's glory, right? To be clothed in God's presence, the radiance, all right? And, and when we talk about, this is important to remember, you know, in the church, we, we talk about glory. Glory is really, we often refer to glory as God's visible presence, as light or as cloud, his visible presence. Uh, we refer to God's presence as grace, right? Grace is God. And there's one, there's one grace. There's one, uh, we also say energy. Uncreated energy is God, right? There's, there's all kinds of different created energies, like electricity, right? We all have energy. It's why I can move my hands, right? I've entered, created energy. Um, but we call God uncreated energy energy and what that means it really it's god's work in in creation but uncreated energy and um uh or or his uncreated uh work or in his grace uh, his glory it's it's all really the same thing so they're clothed in god's radiance in his presence back in the west here grace is a free gift but it's a free gift of what of god of God's, God's very presence, right? That's, that's what saves us, God himself, in a, in a powerful way. We'll talk, we'll, we'll talk about this. Okay, in 18, and uh, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Also, God formed out of the ground all the wild animals of the field and all the birds of heaven and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Thus, whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of heaven, to all the wild animals of the field. But for Adam, there was no, well, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Right? So there's no one really like Adam. There are a lot of animals, a lot of low, lower animals, we could say in the creation, but nothing like Adam, because Adam has been made according to the image and likeness of God. Thus God brought a trance upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and filled up the flesh in its place. Then the Lord God built the rib he took from Adam into a woman and brought her to him. So Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now the two were naked, both Adam and his wife, and were not ashamed. I have to say, be careful to say naked, because being from West Virginia, we say naked. And uh, Father James, when I read that gospel for Matins in that cycle of resurrection gospels, he's, he checks on me sometimes just to see <laughs> if I'm using correct English. So um, here, here we have this beautiful creation, Adam and Eve. Notice how many more verses uh, that the scripture uses to describe the creation of woman. And it has been said that in the creation, uh, it, that the creation unfolds from the uh, from the simplest to the most complex, 
of the creatures in creation. And I would not argue with that. So we have the creation of, uh, of humanity here, right? Of, of human beings. Remember that there, when we talk about man, uh, we, the word man, it used to mean just generally like human beings, right? <laughs> we, have, we have all kinds of levels of confusion uh, these days, but the word uh, anthropos means essentially human being. It's often translated as man. That's where we get anthropology, right? And, and we have specific words for male and female. But uh, we talk about anthropos, the, we talk about mankind uh, or human beings. Remember, God created male and female that are not the same, that are complementary. Right? And you see from the very beginning this general idea of loving the other from the very beginning, right? And not loving the same, loving the other, reaching out to that which is, is different, right? And yet, yet complementary. And male or female are meant to. Uh, to complete each other. You see, Father, send me that question in, in regard to that. Uh, I know in, in the in the wedding ceremony, they say that a quote for that for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and two shall become one flesh. I never understood for this cause what that meant. Yeah. Cause. Well, it's it's this um, was really the leaving, right? The leaving the father and the mother is this. Uh, idea of um you know two people coming from their families and in the ancient world i mean you kind of joined one family or the other but uh, of of leaving parents right and and two individuals joining together uh, again this is sort of this 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 going out this outward movement right not just staying in the family but going outward from parents and uh and joining together and creating a, a new singularity, right? This, this, it, it's hard, especially in, in Christian marriage, it's hard to underestimate uh, the, the unity that exists between male and female, between, between husband and wife, not just male and female, but that unity. And you see, you know, it's, it's symbolized in, biologically. I mean, you have male and female that are biologically different, my am I bold, right? The male and female are biologically different, complementary, not just different, complementary. And that complementariness creates a new human being, right? That's, that's, that's an amazing thing. Again, this going outward from self, right? This, a new human being comes out. So let me, let me move on. Can anybody tell me what time it is? When I share my screen, I don't see my clock. 7.50. Okay. Okay. I've got about 10 minutes. I'll take some questions. Um, I want to get a little bit farther, a little bit farther here. Um, okay. So it gets to chapter three, right? Now the serpent was more cunning than all the wild animals the Lord God made on earth. There are a lot of ways to understand this, but the serpent we talk about certainly was more cunning because he was uh, an angelic being, right? And angels, angels are very intelligent beings. They're bodiless, at least they're bodiless from our perspective, not necessarily God's perspective, right? They move very quickly. I once knew a, a monk who justified driving fast because the monastic life was you know, the, the re reflection of the life of the angels. <laughs> I hope, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if all monks drive fast, but you know, it may need, it may have needed his guardian angel. But, but the serpent we're talking about, right? This is, this is the devil, right? This, this is the one that decided I am going to, through disobedience, I am going to become like God, right? Essentially, like overthrow God. Like he's, he, he want, he's going to become equal. Like there could be, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and somebody else, right? And the essence of God is personalized. There's no like sea of essence out there, like in Hinduism, right? There, the Father is God in essence. The Son is God in essence. The Holy Spirit is God in essence. 
So the, the essence of God is personalized in Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But this being, he was a creature, but he thought somehow that through disobedience, he could overthrow God. So what does he do? Like he, let's try this. Let's try this again. And tries to con convince man who's in the image of God that he could do this, right? And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat from every tree in the garden? Well, God didn't say that, right? God said you can eat from every tree in the garden. Just don't eat from one. So this is, this is kind of, you know, he's good because he's smart. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden, but from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And what's recorded is God not saying, don't touch it, but don't, I don't eat it. But not touching it is another layer of protection for you. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die by death, right? That is like a direct contradiction to what God said, right? He said, you will die by death. And he says, no, you won't, you won't die by death. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God's knowing good and evil, right? So what he's telling them is, you can become gods. The one who failed is telling them, if you disobey God, you can become gods yourself. And you will know good and evil. That's the promise here. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree beautiful to contemplate, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of the two were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings, right? And what do we see in the historic interpretation of the church? That what happened is this. Adam and Eve expected through disobedience from this beautiful creature, right? I mean, angels, can they can be beautiful. It's created glory, right? It said that the devil, his problem was he became enamored with his own glory. Right. And but but what are we destined to be? To be radiating with divine glory. That's that's what that's what Peter, James, and John saw on Mount Tabor. When they say in the beginning of John, when John says in his gospel, we beheld his glory, they saw his glory. Christ said, Some of you standing here will not right taste death before you see the kingdom of God come. And then the transfiguration. He's the, it, and what they saw in the transfiguration, by the way, is is the human Jesus Christ radiating with the same glory that closed Adam and Eve. That, that created the universe. But that we'll talk about that later, too. So here, their eyes are open, but it's open to a completely different way than they expected. They don't see their eyes are not open for them to see themselves as gods. Their eyes are open to see themselves stripped naked. Watch your chairs. Oh, so yeah, make sure you're on mute. I, I need to care about Somebody, football. somebody's not on mute. <laughs> <just sent> by <laughs> Rob. <laughs> All right. Um, so what, what they saw, they, they, their eyes were open yeah, for them. There we go. Okay. Um, so their eyes were open not to see themselves as gods, right? To having ascended to this perfection that they were supposed to ascend to in obedience, by the way. The problem was not there's something wrong with the tree. We say that the, the fruit of the tree was not ripe yet, which what that means is they were not ready for it. And we see that, right? They had like one commandment. As we pray during Lent, you know, oh Lord, like Adam didn't keep one commandment. Like what hope is there for me? You know, <laughs> forgive me, right? Uh, for all of my, my sins. So their eyes were open. To see what? Their eyes were open to see themselves stripped naked of the glory that they had. Right? And, and their eyes were open in such a way that no longer was, was anything that is corrupt. Uh, that was never part of their experience, right? Maybe it, it could be a concept in the mind, which if you don't experience it, you can't really conceive of it very well, right? Like whatever we can, whatever we think about heaven, that's not heaven, right? That's our imagination. Heaven's greater than what we can conceive. And we can't really conceive of a world without sin because this is what we know. 
but it could be, it could have been a concept, but their experience was, was purity and goodness and health. But their eyes now were open to see the experience of death. That's what sin does. It brings death. And now the purity that they had, the health that they had, that was a memory. It's a different experience. In fact, in orthodoxy, we summarize our basic problem as human beings as death. Because for us, death is not just mortality. It's not just the physical side of death. But what death is really, it's an absence of life. And who is life? Life is God. And not having the absolute fullness of his presence, that's, that's death. And as far as we don't have the fullness. And that's what Adam and Eve saw, right? They physically died much later, by the way. But they experienced the darkening of the heart. Remember, for ancient Christians, the heart is not about the place of emotion. It is the spiritual intellect. It's the eye of the soul. You experience God. like God With our brains, God can only be like a philosophical concept. And I use the, theory, the, the uh, analogy of one of my friends. Some of you know Dr. Engelhart, the reader Herman, who is professor of philosophy at Rice University. Um, and the late uh, reader Herman uh, said, you know, if I come home, so he said something like this, right? If I come home and, and my wife says, I have five proofs for your existence, then either she's gone crazy or there's something wrong with our relationship, right? These proofs for God's existence, these are, it can only, uh, they're only philosophical concepts, right? But God is not a philosophical concept. God is person. He's personal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we know him and we experience him. To know and experience God for us is the same thing. How do we do experience him with the heart? That's why you can't know God without repentance. Because only repentance and grace purifies the heart. And you can read like as many books as you want and get as many PhDs as you want in theology, and you, you're not a real theologian from our perspective, right? That only comes through prayer and repentance. And it's the darkening of the heart. That was the center of his problem. Of course, when your heart's darkened, you don't reason well either, right? I said in my recent podcast, when people are intelligent and have lots of degrees, they just are able to uh, rationalize and justify bad behavior in a more sophisticated sort of way. So it makes perfect sense to them. Uh, because they have the you know all these logical uh, reasons for doing what they do, but if it's sinful, it's still sinful. So that's what we see with Adam and Eve here, and it re reminds us of the importance of obedience. Right? Obedience is central to the spiritual life. We don't like that as Americans, right? Just like we don't like the fact that Christianity, it's it's about us and God, not me and Jesus. Right? It's always about us. We've lost our sense of community and dependence on each other. It's why God only answers prayers, perhaps, when we, other people pray for us, right? He can do it if we just pray to him. But there are our own prayers, but he teaches us we need each other. That's, that's the Christian way. And uh, it's the Christian way is, is the way of obedience in the heart. And if we're not obedient, that, what, what that is is just the, the, the way of, of life, of the experience of God. And through disobedience, we leave that stream of God's grace. And where, where do we go? We go off the path into death, right? And sin produces death, and death produces more sin. And that affects us. That affects the people around us. It, it destroys relationships. It does all of that, right? I hate to end now, but uh, I hope you've learned something. And this has been a little enlightening for you. Uh, anybody have any questions? What time is it now? I don't want to go over too much. 8.02. Oh, that's not, okay. I try to end around in about an hour, but take a few minutes if anybody has any, any pressing questions about anything. Okay. Uh, Father Simon, I have a question. What is the name of your podcast? Uh, I can send it out on my email list. It's called Primary Care Priest. And okay. uh, that's the one really for medical people. I have one. Uh, another one coming out, but I'll, I'll send, I can send that out on the email list as well, as long as uh, you're on my email list uh, that's coming out as well. And I might go ahead and send out my podcast, my, my YouTube channel too. There's some things on there that deal um, 
with really an orthodox understanding of some, uh, well, really some basic uh, orthodox understandings of the life of Christ and his work. We're going to talk about that God willing next week. We didn't get to the end of Genesis three, but we're going to go ahead and talk about like, how does through Christ uh, work uh, in the world? How does he undo what is done in Genesis? Through, uh, you know, in, in the West, we emphasize a lot the cross, but there's more. You know, when, when St. Paul says, I have nothing to preach but Christ and him crucified, he didn't mean he doesn't preach like the resurrection and other things, right? So, th so in, in the West, it's heavy on cross. But in ancient Eastern Christianity, it's also heavy on incarnation, right? Like, like the nativity is big. When, when God takes human nature and perfects it and heals it, right? The new Adam, we're going to talk about this, right? The incarnation is, is, is huge. And the, from the incarnation, the baptism, actually, Christ's baptism has significance. His transfiguration has significance. His uh, crucifixion, his, his burial, his resurrection, ascension, Pentecost, all of these things really are, are together. And in the West, in some streams, we really kind of narrowly focus. But we're going to talk a lot about like worship and sacrifice. And really, next week, God willing, the role of the cross in a different way, right? Uh, and we may talk about this too. Like, why is the West so different now? The way we understand things, right? Many people understand uh, what's going on in Genesis and what goes on with the work of Christ with this legal model. Because if your problem is legal guilt for sin, then your solution ends up being needing a legal not guilty. And, and, it, and it's, it's, what's really interesting is the parts of Roman Catholicism, not only that Protestantism said that we don't want this, but the parts that were kept from Roman Catholicism that actually were developed within Roman Catholicism and not, were not part of the ancient church. Right. And you'll hear me talk a lot about healing. Our problem is death. And if our diagnosis is death, then what do we need? Healing from death. And we're going to look at the, uh, the crucifixion, especially in terms of not only healing from death, but the destruction of death. Right. And, and that's, I mean, for, for us within the church, that's, that's really um, not unusual because it's uh, reinforced all the time, right? And in our hymnography, right? As we, as we pray, we believe, right? So if you go to church all the time and you really listen, uh, then, then you hear all this all the time. Like if you go to Holy Week or you pick up, I mean, you know, you go through this Holy Week service book, the theology of what Christ has done, like is there and you get it, right? Through, through the service and through, through the cycle of reading. And we do Old Testament reading and New Testament reading, and you get to make all those connections, right, of how everything kind of works together. So we're going to talk about next week, God willing, again, we'll kind of keep coming back, right, to, to Christ, um, his, his birth and his, uh, the cross and the resurrection and all of that as we go through this, because that, that changes everything in the Old Testament the way we see the Old Testament, right? What we're doing is seeing the Old Testament through the light of his birth, uh, his, his, his transfiguration, the cross, and the, the light that comes from the tomb, his ascension, and, and the Holy Spirit, right? That, that's how we interpret everything in the Old Testament. And it's always been there because God has always been there, right? The Old Testament is leading up to what happens in the New Testament. It's preparing for that. In the New Testament, and it's prefiguring it, and it's showing it forth. So when we go back and we look, right, we see we see the we see the New Testament throughout the Old Testament in a much deeper uh, way than we do if we read it without uh, the New Testament at all. All right. Any other questions? Pressing questions. I have one question about the. Uh ancient conception of the spiritual heart father is yes. that referring to what the greeks called the noose yes yes we often leave it untranslated in texts because it's 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 really difficult to translate right n o u s is how you would transliterate that from greek um and um 
Yeah, in, in early Christianity, it's very specifically not the rational mind by which we do science and academics and we study things. The, the, the concept, right? The brain and the mind are, are you know, they correspond. Uh, and the heart, the physical heart corresponds to the spirit. And that was a, a, a normal way of understanding. And that's the only way to understand, actually, the Christian spiritual life. What makes it very confusing is, I think, if you read Roman Catholic translators, they will translate noose as mind. And a Western reader just thinks, oh, it's, you know. even for us as Orthodox, I mentioned this in my sermon Sunday, what's contemplation? When we think about contemplation, we think about thinking about things in our, in our mind up here, right? Oh, I contemplated that, you know. But contemplation for us means that the heart is in a continual communion with God, so that our heart, we're praying without ceasing. Our heart is praying all the time, even when our mind is doing something else. It's a continual state. That's actually the natural state of the heart, right? Praying without ceasing doesn't mean that we're saying prayers in our brain all the time. If somebody's doing surgery on you, you want their brain to be focused on where they're cutting right? But I'd like their heart to be in communion with God and praying too, right? There's a story I heard a long time ago about a nun that the monastery had to ask to leave because she, she's deserted. She was going to pray all the time and she kept like wrecking vehicles and everything. So the, the heart is, um, is, is, is the noose. And it can be called the spirit, the eye of the soul, the spiritual intellect, as opposed to rational intellect. Um, and a lot of things. So for us to know God, to see God, right? When, when Peter, James, and John saw Christ on Mount Tabor, that wasn't just an external thing they saw. It was an experience of Christ in their heart, within them. They too were transfigured, right? In fact, it's not like Christ's glory just went, bam, there's his glory. His glory is always there. It's just everybody's too blind to see it. He's radiant with glory. You know, it, it said, um, I think St. Gregory Palamas uh, expressed this, that how, how did the elder Simeon know when this woman named Mary brought her baby that this was the one, right? It was the salvation of the world, the glory of Israel. Think about that glory of Israel, the light to enlighten the Gentiles. This man who, who God would not, told him he would not die until he saw it. And what did he see? This baby came to him. And as St. Gregory puts it, his, the, the uncreated glory of God, right, was shining through this baby as its source, right? Not like us, like we, ex, salvation for us is experience, experiencing God's grace, God's glory, right? And when, when it radiates within us, that's, it's still God's glory, right? But this baby, his physical body was the source of the uncreated glory that has no beginning. As though, and shining through it as though the body was thin glass. He saw the light. This is the presence of God. This is the glory that was in the temple. This is the glory that clothed Adam and Eve. And this baby is not only clothed in this glory, he is the source of it. Right? And that's only perceptible with a pure heart. Right? It's not perceptible if you have a PhD and you read a lot. And you know a lot of philosophical, theological concepts. I say philosophy because what we call theology in the West is just philosophy. For us, theology, it's only possible through obedience and humility and repentance. Right? It's, the, it's the gift that God gives us by grace to open the heart and experience his presence, which again is the eternal experience. So to see the vision of Christ in glory, to see the uncreated light, to know God, the deepest sense, um, to contemplate God, all these for us is the same thing. And it's not about the rational mind. Right? We, we, this actually comes, that rationalism comes through Roman Catholic scholasticism, 
that really just kept on rolling into after the Reformation and became very much part of Western Christianity. But for us, everything is about the purification of the heart, only through prayer, repentance, humility. That's the, that, is the, that is the only way. We, we, can't, we can't read our way there, my friends. As I said on Sunday, you know, I used to think if I wasn't feeling spiritual, I just needed to read more, right? But even reading the Bible more doesn't help if you don't live it, right? Because what the Bible is doing, we're not just supposed to read about the powerful experiences of people in the Bible. We're supposed to experience the same God in our own lives right? And and because we're the same church. The Holy Spirit never went anywhere. The Holy Spirit's still here. That's why we still see miracles all the time. All right. Well, I've done enough tonight. I can keep you going. But uh, I, I hope this is enlightening for you, at least in an intellectual sort of way at this point. Um, and uh, we didn't get very far. But again, next week, we're going to kind of close out the very beginning of Genesis, which is the foundation for everything, first chapter, a few chapters of Genesis, and talk about uh, how Christ reverses this. What describe, which is the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament is getting to that, right? And we're going to go ahead and get to that, and then we'll talk about Cain and Abel. See how far we get. We got Cain and Abel. We got Noah. We have uh, the Tower of Babel, or Babylon in Greek. Uh, and uh, and then get maybe to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And remember, Christ is with them. He's not a human being. That you, you notice in the icon of the, the Genesis, uh, we image Jesus creating the world. And that's because the, the only image we have of the Father is the Son, right? And the only reason we can portray Christ in an icon is because he took a human image. Before he, his incarnation, making an image of god was was forbidden but he took a human image that people actually saw so we can portray we we just portray his uh his in, in his human form and put it into uh iconography to show that he was there even though he wasn't a human being he was he was present with the father and spirit all right well god bless you if you have any questions about anything or anything i talked about you want to talk about more please let me know and uh if if you have friends you think would would benefit from this please invite them and god willing uh, I like to end after questions about 8.15, so uh, God willing, we'll pick up where we were last week. God bless you all. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is Indeed risen. Is risen. Good Thank night. you, Father. You're Thank welcome. You. Good, good night. Good night.